So if we have these three different kinds of sedimentary rocks, let's say the organic, the chemical, and the detrital, what turns them into from sediments into rocks? And so that is this idea of cement, that is silica could come in and bind sand grains together, for instance, to give us a quartz sandstone. Or in the case of like a gray wacky, a gray wacky is a muddy sandstone. In that case, you could actually have mud get in there as well, and it forms a matrix. And so a matrix could be clay coats, and there's you can get all sorts of things in the matrix, of course, right? What Depending on what its depositional environment is. And so the process by which we can cement these rocks together, or we can bind them together in some way, that's called lithification. So lithos means rock, and it's the rock forming process is lithification, so... And that's the case with breaches. That's the case with conglomerates. That's the case with sandstones. Even siltstone is that way. And then finally, when you get into the clays, it's more a, a function of compaction. So the first thing, after you apply pressure to them, putting them in the subsurface, deeply burying them, what happens is you squeeze the water out first, and then the, the clay grains will reorient themselves to where they're relatively flat. And uh, you can compact them to uh, roughly, you know, like 30% of what they normally were when they were being deposited. And so that is what happens with the shale, for instance. Here's a kind of an example of it here. This is an interbedded shale and sandstone here. And uh, the, the sandstone has actually been folded, you can see here. Now that happened at pretty close to the time of deposition, shortly after the sandstone was deposited. Uh, you can squeeze the clays, but you can't squeeze the sandstone so much, all right? So you can bend them, but you can't squeeze them, essentially. So And, and so these rocks, when you have interbedded sandstones and shales, this is from Woodson County in Kansas. There's a road cut right here, uh, close to Rose Dome, as I recall, and so a little bit south of Yates Center. Uh, this is a place, in fact, where Back 300 million years ago, that was an area that was shallow seas and there were um, deltas depositing sands and then also some shale out in here, very quiet water out at the end of some river that no longer exists. And so that uh, that is an accumulation associated with that river system there. However, there is oil associated with this as well. So it's very interesting to... Uh, to see the rocks here, but that sort of fold right here, we call that a sin sedimentary fold. In other words, it happened at the time of deposition, roughly, roughly at the time of deposition. So, um, so uh, for the next one, you've already seen this before. This is from the Bahamas, pretty much. Uh, those are detrital ooids right there, or egg shapes, if you will, and ooid. And uh, you can see them in thin sections. So one of the ways that geologists study rocks is to cut very thin slices of the rock. And in this case, it uh, has some blue dye in it as well to, in order to determine what the lithology, or what type of minerals are in there. In this case, uh, the ooids here are uh, cemented together with calcite. And so uh, and on the right-hand side, in that upper slice up there. That's only 30 thousandths, oh, 30 microns thick, so 30, 30 thousandths of a, a millimeter thick, I think it is. Yeah, so 30 microns thick anyway. So the uh, the woods over here on the left-hand side, they're usually, they have to be less than two millimeters, kind of like sand grains, right? They're, they're essentially carbonate sands, right? And uh, But they accumulate one layer at a time when they roll around in the ocean floor. So you're going to see some oolitic, uh, it's called oolitic. Oolite actually refers to a rock body, okay? So the Short Creek oolite is the correct way to, uh, Short Creek oolite is made out of ooids, okay? So ooids. And so these are ooids right here. They're not oolites. Oolite is a rock body. Um, so uh, on the next slide, this is another depositional environment. This is actually where it's accumulating today. Those are, that's called white sands. In this case, the sand here, uh, not made out of carbonates like the ooids are. Those are carbonate sand, carbonate sand grains. This is actually sulfate <laughs> minerals in here. And uh, you can see what looks to be tire tracks down there, but that's not actually tire tracks. 
That's actually where the gypsum got cemented along the fronts of other sand dunes that would have formed at one point. So these are sand dunes that are accumulated out of selenite. Selenite is that one variety of gypsum, of course. So if we look at the next slide, you can actually see the sand grains here. Nancy's holding up a, a pile of them here from white sands. And that's what selenite looks like down here at the bottom down here. But little tiny crystals of selenite in, that are in that sand, which is kind of cool when it comes right down to it. So you can actually wind blow little tiny crystals of selenite in order to make sand. When you fly over this area with a, you know, like say jets or whatever, all of that selenite or that gypsum has the capability of absorbing, of absorbing the sound. And so it's, very, it's like being in a, what do they call them, an, echo, an echoic chamber, and it's, uh, it absorbs the sound here. And so pretty kind of, it's kind of cool. That's why they use gypsum, in fact, for a wallboard. It absorbs some of the sounds between rooms and so forth, a drywall. Um, so white sands uh, made out of the mineral gypsum, where it accumulated actually, or where it actually grew, was in a lake nearby. And then every once in a while, the, the winds whip up and they blow the crystals along and downwind, and they accumulate here at White Sands National Monument. So kind of a, kind of a unique setting here. So it's an evaporite deposit that then became windblown sand grains. Ah, kind of kind of neat. Uh, it was such an interesting place. In fact, that that's one of the places where they tested the first nuclear bomb ever, you know, and so they blew up in the Trinity Project uh, a little bit farther to the north from here. Um, the, uh, the Trinity explosion, and so they, uh, they made a new mineral when they do them. Well, it's not really a new mineral. Uh, they call it tritiumite, but it's actually tritiumite, but it's actually a uh, man-made, right? So it's like it's an artificial mineral of, of sorts. So that is the uh, the explosion uh, plume right over here, the explosion bubble, if you will, from that uh, first uh, atomic bomb uh, explosion. So, but the next slide, it shows you where, what it looks like to have uh, an actual evaporite pan. They call these things pans sometimes. Um, it's a lake, really is what it is, but it's rich with all these ions, and the ions get together when they evaporate the water and they lock in these minerals, and so then they get deposited. In this case, we're, we're building crystals out of halite, and so the halite accumulating here at Badwater is a precipitate of, of course, sodium and chlorine here. And you get some funny sort of shapes out of this. You know, you think of, of halite as having that sort of uh, cubic cleavage, right? And that's how you were able to identify it. But in fact, there's all sorts of strange sort of structures you can get. They're like hair-like crystals of halite that can form in some cases where the water allows it to like build upward and outward. Uh, so this is one of those sort of settings here. And again, uh, bad water is in, uh, is in Death Valley here or so, but gypsum and halite are a little bit like this. Okay, so they both form in that sort of depositional environment. We call them evaporites because they, they are deposited or they're chemically um, formed from the precipitation of minerals in evaporative uh, situations. So some of the halite uh, it forms these hair-like crystals. More typically with gypsum, you get these layers like this. And so this, here you can see layers of gypsum interbedded again with those layers of dolomite. In fact, this is where your samples of, do of, uh, of gypsum, rock gypsum, come from. And so little layers of brown dolomite interbedded with the white layers of gypsum here. Very soft still. Um, it's interesting. These things are almost like tree rings here. Uh, so in places in West Texas here, this is part of what they call the Permian Basin here. These alternations of gypsum and dolomite occurred about 260 million years ago. And it left a cyclic pattern. And so it's almost like tree rings, right? And so you'd have one layer of gypsum, which would represent probably the summer months. And then the dolomite would form as an evaporite mineral as well from seawater flooding into this basin, but then it slowly accumulates uh, through time. And so you have layers after layer after layer of this. As I recall, there's like 10,000 layers of uh, these couplets of gypsum and dolomite that people have recognized. The trouble is when you get into it, 
there's some of them that have been faulted and so forth, so some of the layers get cut. So it's very difficult to make a distinctive single pass through here and try to think that you have some sort of semblance of a record of that cyclicity. But, but in fact, it was a time when there was a lot of the high amplitude climate change going on. And so that's part of what we call today the Castile Formation. So it's a relatively thick interval of gypsum and dolomite here at, out in West Texas. So this next slide here you know, are some of the evaporative ponds that you get in near Canyonlands. In fact, if you drive through Canyonlands, you may get a chance to see some of these things. So these are, are blue, dark blue. And as they begin to evaporate, they become a lighter blue. And then lighter yet, they become a, a, a aqua blue, if you will, and then whiter, you know, it's like, so eventually... These are salts that all the moisture, all the uh, water evaporates from. And you get KCL here, which is a, a type of mineral called sylvite. And then you got uh, K2CO3, which is a, a cal uh, potassium carbonate. And so the, these are both together referred to as potash. And so it's from the potassium that's within them, right? And so potash is the number one thing that people put on crops in order to fertilize them. So it's, it's used as a fertilizer. You wouldn't want to do that with salt because salt would kill a plant, right? But in fact, uh, plants are very tolerant of potassium and potassium is required for plants to grow, in fact. So potash uh, here uh, is an evaporative mineral. It's interesting because... These rocks are not exposed here at the surface. Those are all sandstones and shales that you see here. But deep in the subsurface, in fact, they can drill down to hit evaporite deposits. And what they do is they inject hot water into it, get it to dissolve, bring that water to the surface, force that water to the surface, where it then evaporates under the sun, of course, in these desert conditions here. And so that's part of what they call the paradox formation where they've drilled into it. And so the rocks you see at the surface here are younger than that. So these are like, uh, uh, the paradox formation is Permian in age. So the same age roughly as the Castile. But, uh, but in fact, here you're drilling through rocks that are slightly younger than that in order to get down to the older rocks. So Castile formation accumulated, well, in, the, in this case, the paradox formation accumulated roughly 300 million years ago, not quite as old as the, uh, or a little bit older, in fact, than the Castile Formation. So, but a chemical precipitate, again, uh, due to the evaporative quality, and so this would be considered a chemical rock because it's chemical processes which, which form them. Uh, another chemical rock, people see it every year. Lots of tourists go here. This is a place called uh, uh, Mammoth Springs here. It's at the north side of Yellowstone National Park. Uh, this used to be a place where there were geysers, but the geysers are now gone from here, but the hot springs are still here. And so the hot springs build up these layer after layer of a rock called travertine, in fact. So it's a, it's a hot water variety of limestone. And very commonly, there's actually silica that gets deposited as well. And that's another type of rock called sinter, S-I-N-T-E-R. And so sinter and limestone are being deposited here in a form of travertine. So travertine forms these sort of like little pools. The hot water flows over the top of the pool, and because it's energized a little bit, it gets precipitated there. And so you shake it around a little bit, and it, and it promotes the precipitation of limestone. You know, you know, and you see the same thing, in fact, at some cold water springs, in fact. So here's at Havasu Falls. In, uh, this is in the Grand Canyon, the west end of the Grand Canyon. And here you get these rimstone dams. It's a lot like being in a cave, but not being in the cave. And so as the water falls over the top here, it, it deposits layers of limestone here in travertine as well. And so the, the same process is going on on a micro scale at each one of these little plunge pools down below the main waterfall there. And so that is a type of calcium carbonate here that's being formed uh, from the energy that's released, it's degassing the carbon dioxide. You lose the carbon dioxide, and it promotes the precipitation here then of the uh, of the calcium carbonate. Um, the other thing that happens here, of course, is those rimstone dams themselves are sites that are beneficial for microorganisms to grow. So we might see something like this on Mars. 
In fact, maybe there are places that look like this on Mars that may be related to microbial precipitation of, of uh, calcium carbonate. So that's one of the things that people are looking at, even in space exploration. Are we alone in this universe or is there life on other planets? So it's, it's a major question that we ask. So that's a type of travertine right here. Again, this is a chemical sedimentary rock. Uh, the, tr the center is a chemical sedimentary rock. The potash that you saw uh, previously is a chemical sedimentary rock as well. And then there's this one, of course, and this is chert again. This is a cryptocrystalline quartz. That's the name that we give it is chert or flint. Flint is a darker color variety of chert. But Native Americans, especially in this area of southwestern Missouri, had tons of chert in this area. And so they would use this in order, and they would use it as a trade uh, commodity to trade with other tribes in order to make uh, projectile points, scrapers and things like that. That was the type of tools that they used back then. And uh, so this has a hardness of seven, obviously. Conchoidal fracture, you can see that reflected in the uh, Native Americans would take advantage of, of the fact that it would fracture conchoidally. And then they would uh, uh, use an antler or some other sort of hard substance. First of all, you break it into a blank. And then from that blank, you could turn it into what they call a biface, essentially. So there are two faces. You can tell if somebody's right-handed or left-handed by the way they make their arrowheads and what direction that arrow uh, has the sharp side and which side is not so sharp. And so uh, that looks like a right-handed person right here um, on the on the reddish one here, that piece of red flint here. But, you know, I mean, you can make arrowheads also out of obsidian, which is not a rock at all. Well, it's not a, it's a, it's a, it's an igneous rock. It is not a sedimentary rock. But in this case, this is a sedimentary rock right here. Native Americans took great advantage of that, uh, the properties of chert. So most chert replaces carbonate, but there's a little bit, there is some silica that can accumulate in the deep oceans. It's a silica like ooze in very deep oceans that is, well, we find it on dry land in some places like in Arkansas, West Texas. It, it forms a rock called navaculite. Navaculite is this deep water accumulation of silica way below where any carbonates, any self-respecting carbonate would already have been dissolved at that great water depth because the, the oceans are very cold at depth. That doesn't promote the precipitation of carbonate, nor uh, is, it, is it very um, appealing from a pH standpoint. So the pH tends to, to, I think, go up there. Yeah, so it's a little bit higher pH in, in the deep oceans. You don't, but you don't have the uh, the carbonates there. So maybe low pH, maybe low pH in that case. Uh, you dissolve a lot of carbon dioxide perhaps at, at, water, at great water depths. But anyway, what you do get there is some silica skeletons of things like radiolarians. And so this is a radiolarian skeleton right here. And you can see that it's only 100 microns across. Uh, really tiny, right? So absolutely tiny little creatures that would, their skeletons would accumulate it would condense and then form a rock that was cemented together with silica. In Arkansas, they take that sort of rock and they, they cut it into these slabs like this. And it's a very good surface in order to like uh, sharpen steel. And so they, they call it the uh, Arkansas Navaculite stones are very good for sharpening steel. Uh, so in knives, uh, hunting knives and things like that. So they have dark stones and they have light stones and different hardnesses to them. And so if it's a little bit more weathered, it's going to be the white stone. If it's a little less weathered, it's going to be the darker of the varieties here. So that's an Arkansas whetstone down here at the very bottom. So uh, that is a variety of a organic sedimentary rock then, in fact, when it accumulates as navaculite. Um, so in, in some ways... Um, it never really is detrital. You might call it a, it goes through a process where it was organic at one time, but it's no longer organic. So yeah, there's a little grayness in the categories there. That's, I don't push those very hard. You know, it's like, you can tell if something's been moved by currents. It'll be cross-bedded perhaps. Well, well none of this is cross-bedded. Diagenesis is this process, that lithification process that turns it from sediments into rock in this in this case and again if it's um 
Lithification is the word that we use very commonly. Diagenesis is the process. So lithification means that it's sediments going to rock. And diagenesis means across the formation of that rock, what are the things that happen to that rock? And so it can recrystallize and do all sorts of wild things. Um, next on the list, this is definitely an organic uh, chemical, uh, an organic rock here. It's a biochemical uh, accumulation, in fact. And here you can see a living a coral on the right-hand side, and on the left-hand side, you can actually see a limestone that's comprised of a giant coral head. That's from uh, South Florida here. So this is from Winley Key. It's a state park. And uh, Taverner, I think Taverner Key is not too far away from this, but Winley Key is where there was a quarry that was cut in. Very hard to find limestone resources in some places, right? So where's the rock at? And so, in fact, the keys themselves are made out of rock. Um, ancient rock. In this case, it's about 85,000, 125,000 years old here. There's a span back when the climate and sea level was slightly higher than what it is today, and that's when those rocks were deposited. Because it's on dry land, they can go in and excavate it then, and they cut coral blocks out of this. Very lightweight limestone. And they would use it for like bridge work, foundations, things like that. Of course, there's very little soil there, and so you'd want to have a foundation made out of perhaps rock, you know, back in the 1800s when they first founded the Keys here. Um, so anyway, that is an organic sedimentary rock by definition almost there because it was once a living coral. It became fossilized at one point. And certainly it's uh, there's the living one over here as our modern analog for what uh, formed it. Um, other sorts of organic sedimentary rocks would include some limestones. For instance, there's a couple that you're going to see you know, so it's like it's more than just five varieties of rock that come with the sedimentary rocks. In this case, you can see the chalk uh, up in the upper left here, and that's called the, the White Cliffs of Dover here, very famous in history for being the, the cliffs that were almost, it, it turned Britain into a fortress, essentially, so it was very difficult to invade Britain over the centuries. And so the White Cliffs of Dover are partly responsible for that. It's an area where there was a, a deep water carbonate rock that was accumulating here, relatively deep water. In this case, it's called chalk, and chalk is made out of the skeletons, little tiny microscopic skeletons. That's a scanning electron microscope image down here at the bottom of what are called coccolis. And so coccolis are these sort of like algae, little algal balls that would have lived in the oceans and in, in fact, when they died, the plates would fall apart and would form the rock chalk there. And so that's an organic uh, sedimentary rock, a type of limestone here that's called chalk. Very lightweight, obviously, a lot of uh, porosity in it that gives it that sort of lightweight. Another lightweight rock is cocaine, and cocaine is made out of, of the shells of sea creatures, right? So if you ask me, it's like, well, what's made? what are those seashells? I mean, are those really minerals? It's like, not really when they were deposited. When they were deposited, they were biominerals, right? Just like the coccolith plates were biominerals as well. But eventually, once they've been around long enough and in the natural depositional setting in which they uh, occur, we're going to call it a rock then, and we're going to say that that rock is actually composed of the mineral calcite. And so it's really originally a biomineral. So, but that is two more varieties of organic sedimentary rock here. Now, we first looked at organic sedimentary rocks with coal. And so um, this diagram is a little bit backwards, but it, if you want to follow it, you start down here at the lower right and you follow it from peat, which is a, it's a material that is an accumulation of like wood and resin and all sorts of other debris. But if you can imagine, if you take that and bury that slightly, it's going to turn it into a soft coal. And so eventually those complex carbohydrates, those proteins, the lipids and everything else in there, you're going to drive off the volatiles, you drive off the water, you drive off a lot of the original organic materials, the cellular structures begin to collapse, and eventually you squeeze out the water and then all you're left with then is the carbon eventually. And so the volatile organic materials, the methane leaves, the 
the oils and things like that would leave and eventually you form soft coal. And then there's an intermediate coal that's called bituminous coal. That's a variety that we have in our, our samples. And then lastly, there's an anthracite coal, which you find in some mountain ranges in the eastern part of the United States. And anthracite coal has a very special properties. In fact, it's so metamorphic. Well, it's not really metamorphic rock. It's a sedimentary rock still. But it has been squeezed so much that it forms a very hard coal. And that hard coal, in fact, is used then to form steel. And so they fire up anthracite in order to form a product called coke. And so coke is a product of, of burning anthracite coal into a different type of substance that is then used to mix with iron ores. And so iron ore and coke together form steel. Um, so that's kind of the story of the way that coal forms first as peat and then lignite and then bituminous coal. And then if it's in the right setting, maybe an anthracite coal after that. Let me show you what peat looks like first. Peat is very common in places in Britain, especially the mountainous north and the mountainous west parts of Britain. Uh, so in Scotland, in fact, you see a lot of this. And then actually, and then also in Wales, you see a lot of peat as well. And it's organic material because there's very little oxygen that gets into it. And so that material just accumulates and accumulates, especially in things like peat bogs here. And so that's a peat bog on the left-hand side. And that's a peat accumulation on the right-hand side. Nancy's smelling it to see if it smells like, you know, rotting material. And no, no, it's not decaying. It's actually that organic material. It's a little bit wet. And so what they do in Britain, they actually burn this for energy. So if you wanted to heat your home back in the 1800s, you would take that material and you could cut a trench and cut blocks of peat and then you leave it out in the sun to dry in the summertime. And so in the summertime, you dry your peat blocks and then you could burn it in the wintertime for heat and for fire, for cooking and so forth. And so that is peat on the right-hand side here below the grass. Okay, so you can tell that the grass will live and die and eventually form a peat there. Uh, the material that you see on the left-hand side, that's mostly heather. And so heather is another sort of product. Um, a, a living organism, you know, would, uh, it's a living plant, a heather, and it would accumulate and then form this sort of uh, peat in, in places like bogs and, and things like that as well. Now, one of the other places where you form organic uh, accumulations like that would be in swamps. And so in the United States, we don't have so much peat as we have coal swamps in this case. And so here you can see a swamp that has a lot of living, you know, like looks like duck grass here. You can see that there's a lot of woody material. In fact, those are cypress trees with the big uh, uh, stems, you know, or the big uh, roots at the very bottom down here. And the roots stick out of the water. Uh, those are called cypress knees. Uh, but the cypress knees growing in this water, in fact, anything that is living that dies in the, in the fall, you know, the cypress will shed their needles and all that material falls into the water. And then it falls to the bottom of that sort of setting in that swamp. And it's a low oxygen sort of place. It uses up all the oxygen from the decay. And then once you've used up all the oxygen, it, it can't decay anymore because the organisms that cause decay need oxygen to live. And so it just accumulates and accumulates and accumulates. So that's where you would form something like coal, typically. A uh, different kind of peat in this situation. So if that's where it accumulates in a depositional environment, this, you can actually see it in, in a road cut here, where there's an accumulation of shale at the bottom and then a little bit of sandstone in the middle part, and there's a coal in here. There's a seam of coal through there. So coal has to be mined, of course, from places where it actually would have accumulated. That includes places like Missouri, by the way. So Missouri had coal swamps back during Pennsylvania time about 300 million years ago. So this is uh, not in Missouri here, but this is the same age, and this is over in eastern Kentucky. So there it was a little bit older, some of it. But uh, again, you have an accumulation of coal, sandstone, and shale. The shale and the sandstone would have been fluvial deposits, in other words, riverine deposits. And then the coal would have accumulated in like a swamp setting uh, around in a, in, a, in a river valley, perhaps. And so that's in uh, eastern Kentucky. Um, 
Where do we find coal in the United States? Well, coal is still being used today as an energy product uh, in many places around the world, in fact. But in the United States, it's kind of on the decline it's used. It has been anyway because of renewable energy. When we think about it, coal is actually made out of fossil plant debris, right? And so every time you turn on a light with energy that has been produced by, by coal, um, you're turning on fossil energy from 300 million years ago, roughly. Not always 300 million years ago, but that's the age of the rocks in Missouri that give us the coal here. And um, in the Pennsylvanian. And so the Pennsylvanian, that plant would have lived and photosynthesized energy from the sun, lived, died, and when it died, that material went. And so it's actually a a natural form of sequestration. So these accumulations, you can see where they're mapped here across the United States. So across Missouri, in fact, we have bituminous coals here. Um, The other coals that you see on here, lignite is in the yellow here. And bituminous is mostly in the green and the the gray here. And the very hardest coals, in fact, are down here. You can see a little bit in southern Illinois here, but also in the uh, Appalachians, in the Appalachian Mountains, in Pennsylvania and easternmost uh, Tennessee and and Kentucky. Uh, those Those are settings where you get these hard coals like that. So that's anthracite with the red dots there. Now, the coal that we burn in Springfield for our energy process. We still burn some coal here, not a lot, but some. And it comes from eastern Wyoming, of all places. They have to to have train cars full of the stuff. And so you can see this string of cars down here on the left-hand side, just to show you where it comes from. Um, so we transport it halfway across, well, a third of the way across the continent in order to burn it for energy here. That releases the carbon dioxide that originally was sequestered when the plants sequestered it originally and it accumulated thick accumulations. That's actually an Eocene coal bed. So that's, you know, 50,000, 50 million years old, roughly. Um, and that's up in this um, this northeastern part of Wyoming here. So that green area right there is the coal that we burn in Springfield. The reason we burn that coal here is because it has a lower sulfur content. And so there are sometimes impurities with coal that make them really noxious to burn. So when you burn coal that is from, you know, it's been mined in either Texas or Oklahoma or Missouri, you're burning a high sulfur coal and it's a very large pollutant, I guess you could say. Uh, So it's more likely that you're going to get acid rain from a coal that is burnt from something that has a high sulfur content, makes sulfur dioxide in the atmosphere. Um, and it also makes uh, sulfuric acid in acid rain. So we don't burn lignite so much. It is burned in a few situations. Uh, they mine it in the United States now more for its uranium content than they do for its energy uh, usefulness. Um, but in fact, all across the United States, we are switching mostly to natural gas now because natural gas has become really abundant with this new idea of producing natural gas out of shales. And so shales have, organic rich shales have a a large uh, component of methane. And so you can harvest the methane out of oil shale, uh, excuse me, gas shales. And um, in this case, a few more factoids to point out to you. Each one of those coal cars right there, it takes about 30 hours to burn one of those coal. Let me get this right. I think it's 30 coal cars. Yeah, it's actually 30 coal cars to burn for. Yeah, I'm I'm, I'm confusing my facts here. But anyway, I think it's like 30 hours that you can get out of one coal car. But I I may be off off on that. And it may be in the next slide for all I have to. I went through it once, but, you know. Um, There are some issues with coal mining. In this area of Wyoming, it's all strip mined. And so they'll go in with large loading vehicles and pull the coal out and uh, remove the overburden and then fill in the hole afterwards with all the overburden. You get something they call acid mine leachate from that process. Uh, So many of the 
rocks that are associated with the fill material can become very highly acidic. Um, in some cases, they try to neutralize that acidity, but not very commonly. Um, in places like West Virginia and Eastern Kentucky, the issue, <clears throat> the issue there is what they call mountaintop removal. Because the, the coal may be exposed at the top of a mountain, they decide it's like, well, it's just cheaper to knock off the top of that mountain, put the top of that mountain in the valley next door, and then mine the coal out, and then you have a nice flat spot, um, which would be great for like golf courses and Walmarts. But at the same time, it's like it's destroying the natural waters of that area. And so the valleys become uh, kind of polluted from that. And of course, the valleys are where most of the people actually live in Appalachia. Um, so mountaintop removal is kind of a, a nasty sort of process by which people can extract coal. And even in places where it's not in the mountains, they mine coal like in the Illinois Basin is one of these places. In the Illinois Basin, they do a process called long wall main, mining here. And you can actually see where they're grinding the coal away from the face is like a 10 or 15 foot thick uh, seam there of coal. And they just grind it away. What they, what they used to do in the old days is they would make tunnels essentially through it. And then you would crisscross with other tunnels. And you could take it out with coal cars. In this case, they just use a conveyor belt. And you just grind it all away in this case. And so eventually they move the machinery out of here. And that whole surface is then detonated and it all drops in. And of course, what it does when you drop something in when you're 600 feet deep in Illinois, it makes a 15 foot drop at the surface as well. And so it actually causes land subsidence at the surface. So even though there's no coal exposed at the surface, it can actually cause the subsidence of the materials to, to fall in degrades the, the farming capabilities of that landscape. So it's a bit of an issue there. So I don't know of any way that they are addressing this, this process called long wall mining here, but it can be quite destructive. Mountaintop removal certainly is destructive and it affects the water quality in places that need their fresh water. That's one thing that we have in common with other, ever, every other living thing on this planet is we need water in order to survive. Even in the deserts, you have to have water to survive. And so we squander it very commonly. And so it becomes squandered in this coal mining sort of process um, with mountaintop removal. Um, so that gets us to the next point. I try to not to be too, uh, um, well, political. I'm not political, okay, in this class because I don't choose sides in that. But at the same time, I'm very pro environmental in the sense that we have one planet that we live on. And if we destroy all of our resources, if we burn all the fossil fuels, we're going to have a lot of carbon dioxide left over from that. And that's going to lead to climate change. It already is. Okay, so many of the world's nations have signed on to the Paris Accords, which say that we're going to try to limit how much fossil fuel that we generate. And in fact, the only way to get it back is to plant trees. And so we got, we've got to grow more things that actually photosynthesize and try to lock up that carbon again in order to keep our atmosphere from being overly dense, overly concentrated with carbon dioxide. And some of the other methane, you know, methane is another one of the, the greenhouse gases. And so carbon dioxide and methane are leading to, I think, and water vapor also, but there's nothing much we can do about water vapor in the atmosphere. It is the clouds that we have. We call this planet the blue planet for a reason, because we have these beautiful oceans that we've made, well, that we haven't made. They were here for us. We have, you know, the fisheries that are in the oceans, 99.999% of all the water on earth is in the oceans. And so we have oceans that are being extremely concentrated with carbon dioxide. If that continues, we're going to lose things like the coral reefs because coral reefs, as you know, are made out of carbonate material. That carbonate material, when you introduce acid to it, it fizzes, right? What does that do? Or it releases carbon dioxide and forms... <laughs> acid essentially. So we're acidifying the oceans from the excess carbon dioxide that is in our atmosphere. So most people think that we have about 300 years of coal left. 
We have about 300 years of oil left on this planet. That's 600 years. Human beings have been around for about mm, half a million years on this planet. And even before that, humanoids were around 5 million years ago. And they, they've experienced climate change. Even 60,000 years ago, we were getting climate change. 80,000 years ago, certainly, there was a major rise of sea level, uh, actually a fall of sea level, and then a rise again about 10,000 years ago. So um, climates change. They do it naturally. But in this case, it's being accelerated due to the activities of human beings on the planet. And so fossil fuels, if we can get away from burning fossil fuels, that'd be great. How do we do that? Well, we have to produce more wind energy. We have to be able to produce tidal energy. We have to be able to produce solar energy. These are all sort of things that we're looking to the future. In fact, your generation is going to be the one that's potentially going to make this happen. Hopefully, we can get it kick-started in my generation, but I don't know if that's going to be the case or not. Uh, that remains to be determined um, because I thought people were really with it <laughs> Back in the 1970s, when I was a kid, younger than you, at 12 years of age in the 1970, I remember the first Earth Day. And that Earth Day, we celebrated as like, we're going to turn this planet around. And everybody wanted to solve the world's problems and stop the pollution. And there, the government was behind it. We had all this sort of momentum going towards environmentalism. Uh, Jimmy Carter was elected president in 1976. And so he he put in solar panels on the White House just to make a symbol. It's like, we're going to try to beat this thing. We can do this. And he, he supported nuclear energy. But then again, we had a couple of nuclear accidents back. Three Mile Island was an example of that. Chernobyl happened after that. And then most lately, it's been Fukushima. Now, huge uh, environmental disasters associated with nuclear, right? So how are we going to get around that? Well, you have to produce solar energy or you have to produce wind energy and tidal energy is another way but you have to have tides in order to produce tidal energy you have to be near an ocean to produce that tidal energy so there's, a, there's only a hand well we're getting better with some things we get better with things like led lamps in my house i have totally replaced all of my light bulbs with led lamps because they're much more efficient like 10 times at least more efficient eight to ten times more efficient so we have one planet, and if in 600 years we're going to run out of fossil fuels, we better come up with some other idea. In fact, the fossil fuels, are going to, the prices are going to go skyrocketing, right, you know, in the future at some point. We thought that that was the case with oil and gas as few as 10 years ago. But then this new technique for, for extracting oil and natural gas out of shale rocks, which we had always thought was a petroleum source rock, but not where you would actually produce oil and gas out of it. Well, we learned how to do that. We did it with fracking. And so, yeah, so we got some problems on this planet. And one of those is to keep it sustainable. How can, how can we have 7 billion people, more than 7 billion people on this planet, soon to be 10 billion people within the next 15 years, 20 years? And so how are we going to take care of everybody? And how is everybody going to be able to live and not fight over these limited resources. Um, that's one of the reasons to study, you know, geology is because it is a resource. We have to get these things extracted out of the earth somehow to meet the needs of the economy as we know it. More than anything, how do we find out? You need geology even to do wind energy, as it turns out, because wind relies on natural features in the landscape. And so landscape analysis is one of those sort of geologic processes that we do. So anyway, I'll get off my soapbox now. But we need to support more green energy. And so that's something for the future. We'll see how it happens. We're going to see what's, you know, it may not happen in my lifetime, but hopefully it'll happen within your lifetime and we'll have cleaner water than what we had when you first arrived on this planet and hopefully it'll be clean water and clean air when you leave this planet as well and so that is for us to try to figure out these problems so that we can all get along um so if we have energy resources we're going to we're going to talk about energy resources later in this semester as well uh, but we've talked about coal now so this is probably as much in depth we're going to talk about coal 
Burning coal releases a lot of pollutants into the atmosphere. By burning natural gas, we've cut down our emissions in carbon dioxide by a quarter, 25% in our country alone. In our country, we have reduced that sort of, the pandemic too has reduced the carbon dioxide that's been released from energy production as well. Where does that energy come from? You saw where the coal map was, right? It's in the eastern part of the United States, in the Rocky Mountains, in that area of the United States as well. It used to be produced in the Midwest, but that's declining. Um, and probably we're going to get away from burning coal at some point. Natural gas and oil, well, natural gas kind of stepped in where coal was, right? So we produce a lot of natural gas in the United States as well. Some people have compared us to the new Saudi Arabia, they say, because we produce so much oil and gas. And a reflection of that actually is in the price of gas right now, which is roughly $52 a barrel. If we're only paying $52 a barrel and there are 42 gallons of crude oil, only 42, okay, it's not 55 gallons. In like a, you're used to saying a drum, a barrel of oil you might think is 55 gallons. It's 42 gallons. So 42 gallons, U.S. gallons, not imperial gallons. 42 U.S. gallons in a barrel of oil. That's what's taking the place of coal now. Almost everybody's burning natural gas instead. And natural gas, once you burn it, that's carbon dioxide. It doesn't have the pollutants that coal had, however. So we produce it out of basins. Basins become really essential then for petroleum. So basins, in fact, are these large deposits thick deposits of sedimentary rock. All of our energy resources come from those. Almost all of our energy resources come from those. 99.999%. Okay, so that's where uh, a good example of this is the Michigan Basin. And so they produce oil and gas in Michigan. Recently, they began, you know, in the last 15 years, they produced a lot more oil and gas out of Michigan. Michigan's the state that looks like a mitten, okay? <laughs> um, with Saginaw Bay right here in the middle. And the Upper Peninsula at the top, too. That basin is relatively thick, and it has oil accumulations within it. The oil, in fact, is found around the perimeter of that basin. Now, here's a, a key definition for you. What is a depositional basin? A depositional basin is where there's an accumulation of sediment or sedimentary rock that's greater than one kilometer. In Springfield, Missouri, we have 1,800 feet of sedimentary rock over granite, roughly granite down there and some weathering remains of granite down there. 1,800 feet is about 600 meters. That's less than a kilometer, so we are not in a basin here. The basin that we are close to, in fact, is in Arkansas. In Arkansas, they have the Arcoma Basin, named for Arkansas and Oklahoma. In Illinois, they have the Illinois Basin. In Kansas City, they have the Forest City Basin. And a little farther to the west, it's Salina Basin. There are basins all over the United States, and almost all of them have oil and gas in them. The most recent one that people have been really keen about developing is the Williston Basin. Well, the Williston Basin is in North Dakota and Montana and a little tiny bit of South Dakota. And so they produce oil and gas out of that as well. It's where sea creatures once lived and died and were buried in that organic material then accumulated in the form of crude oil and methane, which was later derived from the pressuring of that burial of those rocks, from the rise of the Rocky Mountains, it buried some of those rocks under sediment. And so you would get these huge accumulations, in fact, of shale. And so that's what they're mining, essentially mining. They don't mine it. They actually drill for it laterally and produce natural gas out of places like Williston Basin. And they produce oil out of the same rocks as well. They're doing the same thing here in Michigan as well. So these basins are really important for energy resources. Until we can replace our existing fleet of cars, our fossil fuel burning cars with electric vehicles, and we can produce that energy for the electric vehicles by wind energy and solar, we're gonna to continue to burn fossil fuels. It's just the nature of humans. We tend to use a resource until it becomes prohibitively costly 
or may even become exhausted. And so that's just the nature of humans on this planet. We got to stop that. We have to think ahead. We're the one species that has made it to other planets. <laughs> We've just landed on Mars again, right? We've landed on the moon. And many nations have done it. China has been able to do it. The Soviet Union and now Russia has been able to do it. We have an international space age. Can't we work together to solve this problem? How are we going to get the energy resources to fuel our economy? Because right now, right in the middle of winter, you can go down to a Walmart and buy a head of lettuce. Well, you can't grow it this way right now. It has to be shipped in from somewhere. Well, it comes in from Mexico. It comes in from other warm regions where they're able to sustain the agriculture. But we're ruining the soils too. So I, it's hard to be optimistic about the future of the world. But if you put your mind to it, we can, if we all put our minds to it, we can maybe solve this problem. So anyway, I'll get off my soapbox again here. That's a basin right here. That is a basin in Michigan Basin right here. Here's a cross-section of that basin, in fact, right here. So cross-section shows you how thick those sediments are in the middle. The younger rocks are deposited in the middle of this thing, and the older rocks are down or on the perimeter of this thing. And so what you see here is a whole series of faults and everything that formed that basin. In fact, that basin has accumulated sedimentary rocks mostly from oceans, as it turns out, as oceans once covered the continents. And they may again, if we keep burning fossil fuels, because we're melting the glaciers. The glaciers are going to cause a rise in sea level. Current estimates are around six or seven meters higher than what it is currently. That's going to flood the eastern seaboard of the United States and many of the valleys in the west. Um, we're going to see some changes maybe in your lifetime. It's going to flood countries like the Netherlands. It's going to flood Belgium. It's going to flood the low-lying areas of China. It's going to flood many of the coastal areas um, in, in Korea, in, in, in Japan. Um, and in some places, even in Australia, you will get flooded. You know, So it's going to affect the entire world. The island kingdoms of the world, or the island nations of the world, like Tahiti, Tonga, and all these other places, they're already thinking ahead because they're going to lose their land to the sea. Uh, so the seas are going to take over. And it may not even be good for the things that live in the sea. And it probably won't be, I can tell you that. Okay, so in the very end of this, I wanted to give you a summary. And I want to be, you know, less dogmatic about my environmental stances about how we need to treat the earth. If you're not doing it already, I, I got to ask you, please recycle uh, the plastics. Well, that gets extracted out of the earth. It's energy resources. Always, that's the side byproduct is the plastics that come out. Uh, the coal, turn the light switches off when you can. Um, yeah, it's just like be mindful, I guess, that you live on a planet with seven and a half billion other people and that if we tend to waste things, that it's going to affect the future generations of humans on this planet. Um, so the sedimentary rocks are the storybook of this planet. Now, sedimentary rocks go way back, way before even 500 million years ago. So there are sediments that were around several billion years ago, and they record Earth's history. So Earth's history is written in the sedimentary rocks more so than the igneous rocks. Why? Because it's the sedimentary rocks that give us the history of life as well. The earliest living creatures are found in sedimentary rocks. That's why we're going to Mars to try to look at the rocks there to see if they have stromatolites in them. The earliest sort of primitive creatures that could have existed on this planet may have been the ones that potentially could have existed on Mars as well. These rocks, these sedimentary rocks that tell that story, we have to interpret that story, and we interpret it by interpreting what the depositional environments are. So you've seen examples, in fact, for deep marine settings. For instance, like when we talked about gray wacky, shallow marine settings, when we talk about limestone and the little onchoids, or with a little tiny BB-sized <laughs> little uh, ooids that would accumulate in the seafloor as well. Or the crinoids that accumulate in huge masses across southwest Missouri here. And they lived and died. 
when the seas were across our landscape. So that story is from the sedimentary rocks. And so we have a really pretty thin cover of sediments across the entire world. In the deep oceans, it's not very thick at all. But when it comes to like the continents, there's a sedimentary thickness there that can be up to 35 kilometers, in some cases a little bit more than that. It's like a, a thin sedimentary cover over the entire world. It, but it's very thin. In the oceans, it can be zero, okay, but up to 15 kilometers thick in trenches and places like that where there's more of a tendency to accumulate sediments. We have all of the resources that we use, coal, petroleum, and the water resources. That's the one I haven't mentioned yet because we're going to talk in, in great detail about water later on. But the water resources, for the most part, we use are, well, partially surficial, but we also get spring water and we have well water. And so those are important to protect those. And so it literally is the ground upon which we walk. Now there's soils over the top of that, but it is the, in fact, what they put the foundations in pretty much every building in Springfield for sure. And many places around the world, it has to be the place where we build our buildings. And so that's what we build our artificial caves that way, right? That's where people live and that's where people work and contribute to this world experiment that we're in. That's the story of sedimentary rocks. We're going to deal a little bit more about with sedimentary rocks when we talk about key geologic principles as well. But it's not exclusively sedimentary rocks. So, but we will see some. And so that's going to be in the next segment. Thanks for your attention. This segment is really important to me, I guess. I hope that you find it was important to you as well. Hopefully you learned a, a little bit from the, the three parts of sedimentary rocks. One from last week and these two for this week so far. And that ought to be the remains of what we'll use for the quiz, which will be coming up at the end of this week. And so just the three sedimentary rocks are enough to know for the quiz on Friday. But I will go ahead and record the key geologic principles and put that up as well for week seven here. But just know that the material presented in that will be for the next week, the quiz on the next week. Anyway, thanks for, thanks for your attention. Anyway, I'll talk to you soon. Bye now.